Will you bow with me with another word of prayer? Let's pray. Blessed Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that you not only gave us to Christ, but you gave us your word. Father, we recognize that you have given us promise after promise to all of those who are your children. And Father, we have the words right here in front of us. We thank you for the fact that we have your counsel, which is for us in building us up into fullness and maturity of Christ. We pray this morning as we come, bef uh, come before you, as we read and go through your word, Father, we just pray that we will see Christ. We pray, Father, that our hearts and our minds will be open to your word. We pray, Father, that any distractions and snarements may be cast aside. Father, help us to be singularly fixated upon you, upon Christ. And so, Father, let kindness leave us now. Let distractions stay at the door. And help us, Father, to fall more in love with you, more in love with Christ this morning, I pray. In your son's most blessed name. Amen. Where do you run for help? In situations where you feel like you're overwhelmed, in situations where often you feel like you're outside your comfort zone, where do you run for help? You see, we're, we're dependent creatures. Indeed, we're, we're made and we were made to be dependent creatures. Our lives, day by day, evidence that we are not all sufficient. As much as we'd like to think we are, we're not. And indeed, when you think, really think about it and you take a step back, our whole upbringing, our whole life to this point testifies to the fact that we are so dependent upon other people and upon others. Even from when our conception and when we're brought out into this world, we are utterly helpless and dependent upon our parents. And, and whilst we become more self-sufficient as we grow up, we are still dependent upon others. And that's because at the end of the day, we recognize that we ourselves are not all powerful. We are not immortal. We are not all-knowing. That unless, that we, unless we are somehow ensnared by pride and believe that we are all self-sufficient, we recognize that we need to be dependent upon other people, upon others. And that's why when problems arise in our lives, and problems do arise, it's very easy, not necessarily big issues, but small issues as, as well. When they arise, what do we do? We go to others. Our car breaks down, we go to a mechanic. We get sick, we go to a doctor. We recognize at the end of the day, we are dependent creatures. We're not self-sufficient. But there's an issue there. Because whilst we are dependent creatures, as we go running to someone, there's always a possibility that the person that we're running to may not be able to help us. Or that their help, or they, and they may not even want to help us. You know, t about two weeks ago, I was asked by a colleague who sits across from me, and they asked me, they, asked me, uh, uh, they looked over and said, Brett, can you help me with a calculation with algebra? Now, for those who know me, my eyes instantly glazed over when they mentioned the word algebra. The reason is, is because whilst I can help with some things, never ask me about my math ability. <laughs> it's non-existent. I am absolutely and utterly useless unless we're talking about things like additions and multiplications. I'm okay with that. If anything advanced, nope, sorry, I'm not the person to be able to help you. But as I passed on my sympathies, as I, uh, my apologies, and as I passed on my deepest uh, sympathies, that it was something regarding algebra, it was clear that I was not the person who could be able to help her with the problem. And that's the flip side. Like many people, I have a desire to help when I can. 
And of course, sadly, we don't always help out of a pure motive. That is true because pride can easily bubble up in our lives. But as we end up in situations when we're asked for help, we're asked for a form of help that we can't ourselves help with. Where we ourselves are confronted with our own limitations, our own fallible selves. Both we, we recognize that not only does that person need to depend on someone because they're running to you to, for assistance, but you yourself need to be, de be dependent upon someone else as well because you're unable to help. But the, but the reality of our impotency, our inability to help everybody who comes to us whenever they do come to us, may testify to our overall impotence. The, the fact that we need to be dependent upon others. We're not, we don't have it all. But when we come into the text this morning, it, it testifies to the fact that there can be one to have a greater dependency on, who's utterly dependable, when, who's always willing to hear us, always willing to take in consideration our prayers, our, our petitions, our cares, our problems, all the significant problems that we'll be able to face, we can always run to, and he will never turn us away. And he is, unlike us, not fallible, not weak. Now, for those who are, who are taking down uh, notes, my structure for this morning's uh, sermon is that uh, I have uh, the hopelessness of man, the compassion of Christ, and the beckoning hope for all. But as we, as we return to chapter 9 this morning, to the Gospel of Matthew, it's clear from, the, from what we covered from last week that Jesus here is inaugurating his kingdom. We have seen in chapter 8 that he had been performing miracles. He was bringing healings. He was showing that he had power over not only the natural, but also the supernatural. And that his, in, his kingdom would include disciples, those people who followed him, those who recognized their need and sought to be in Christ, who recognized that they needed to be dependent upon him. Those people would be those who would be included within the kingdom. After all, Jesus said that he had not come for those who were well. He had come for those who were sick, who recognized their need, who recognized they needed a doctor. And this was represented, of course, by the calling of the author of this gospel. Matthew, who was seen as a tax collector and as we covered a few weeks ago, a person who was very, uh, in a particular career, which was very, uh, yeah, it was very uh, reviled at that time. However, Jesus is making it known here in chapter 9 of, as to what he is doing. But in that, as we covered last week, he isn't simply just restarting the old system. He's not simply refreshing the old covenantal system. No, what he is doing, what Jesus is doing here through these healings, and now what he, when he talks to the disciples of John, he's saying that he is doing something completely new. He is inaugurating something that the old system cannot contain and cannot be contained by that system. And as we read later in the book of Hebrews, that system was developed for a particular purpose and a particular time. And then as if to prove his authority, as to prove what he was, what he was doing in bringing forth this new kingdom, we now come to a new set of miracles. And Jesus' miracles, of course, being a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. And we see here in verse 18, and I, I always say this, but, so you're probably used to it now, but please, by all means, try to keep your Bibles open. Let's be people of the word, testing everything I say against it. But in verse 18, we see in verse 18 that whilst Jesus is just talking, so he's, he's just spoken to the disciples of John and talking about, again, the fact that you can't contain uh, new wine in old wineskins. It has to be a new wineskin. As he finishes that conversation... We see there that a leader comes before him and kneels down before him with, with a request, save my daughter from her death. Again, we read, my daughter just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Oh, death, 
Death is the great equalizer, as many of us know. We, death comes to all, none can escape, and we recognize that indeed death is one of the greatest problems that humanity will face. We are born, we live, and then finally we die. And generally we're appreciative of the first, we're happy about the second, and try to avoid the third. I mean, when you look at the pages of history, they are littered with people who have tried to escape or cheat death. The amount of people who have chased after in the medieval period and beyond that for elixirs of, ter uh, elixirs of immortality or the fountain of youth and so forth, people often ran after superstition and other so-called supernatural um, ways of maintaining and preserving life. But in modern times, are we very different in wanting to escape death? Not really. Man has moved from looking at, of course, the supernatural uh, for the preservation of life to technology as its savior. Uh, you might be aware a couple of decades ago, uh, there used to be a lot of discussions around how cry cry uh, cryogenics would be able to b bring a particular way of preservation of life, that you can continue your life as you're frozen until technology comes about which can actually resolve any problems you're going with. So let's just get you frozen up until a point when cancer is overcome and then you'll get thawed out and then a new technology will be applied. Can't, you'll no longer have to worry about cancer. But now there's a new, now there's a new uh, thing on, its, on the horizon which is about AI, and, which involves AI and computers. And now these are seen as real possibility of salvation from death for humanity. Now, anybody who follows the very, uh, uh, the very eclectic in, uh, individual Elon Musk might have heard of his technology called Neuralink, which is about the fact that you can upload your consciousness to a computer. And therefore, your consciousness will be on a computer, and even through your mortal shell, your mortal body will die, you will live on. Again, mankind desperately wants to avoid death. Yet while death is inescapable, it's always lingering on the minds of those who are so invested in this world. It's part of the landscape, it's part of the reality in which we live. And why is that? Why is it part of the reality? Well, we all know why. It's because of sin. Sin, rebellion, lawlessness against God had ushered in had been ushered in by the betrayal of our first parents against God. And as such, the wages of sin were, is what? Death, as Paul states elsewhere. Our first uh, parents brought it in, our own sin, both in disposition as well as actions, well, they pretty much make it certain. But we ourselves, we don't do as we ought. We don't do as we ought, and our allegiance is almost never uh, never to him, it's always to ourselves, never to God, always to ourselves. And this is why death is certain, this is why death is inevitable. It's why it's so hopeless for men, mankind. Because left to their own devices, humanity can never flee death, can never flee destruction. Indeed, we cannot overcome, realistically, we can never overcome our own fragility, the fragility of our existence, we're, we're, we're fragile. If there's one thing that should have taught us anything during COVID, it should have been this, that we are very mortal. But it goes to show how spiritually ignorant we truly are. Because at the end of the day, whilst faced with our own fragility, while faced with our own mortality, what do we do? Do we run to God to our, for our need? No. Mankind runs far from God. Mankind instead seeks to look for help and healing in places with the littlest requirements. They don't want to have the requirements of God or anything like that. They'd rather put requirements in accordance to what they themselves want. And rather than end up in the dependency upon the Creator, mankind prefers to depend on hope in our own knowledge and our own ability to bring salvation to ourselves. That's 
a human condition. We prefer to rest in our own ability, our own comfort, our own knowledge, thinking that somehow will eventually save us. And this isn't, I'm not saying here that you can never depend on another human. Don't get me wrong here. What I am, whether they're friends, family, doctors, or other, others, but I'm, I'm just saying if, they, if we were to get a paint scraper and just take off some of the paint, the facade, just take off a little bit of our facade and examine where our greater dependency is, as in who are we truly dependent upon? Is it upon man or is it upon God? Are we reliant upon man through God or are we reliant on man alone? As in, do we recognize that man as a God's, use, uh, God's tool, God's use for our help or do we, again, rely on man for help alone? This is something that we have to ask ourselves. Who do we actually depend on in our lives? Who do we rely on? For as Jesus and the disciples got up and followed the leader, uh, the, the leader the, which again in our text this morning, leader here is just as an aside or as a, a bit of a note, leader here, and we get this from some of the other gospel accounts of this, uh, of this narrative, leader here is a leader of the synagogue. We know this person's name, that this was Jairus. And Jairus was a, again, a, the, Jairus was a, a religious leader, again, a leader of the synagogue. And as they got up to follow him, when he pleaded, got on to his knees and pleaded with Jesus, we see that a woman approaches Jesus, thinking to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I can just touch it. I'll be made well. Now, this woman had been bleeding for 12 years, and of course, uh, many of you are probably uh, under, uh, uh, understanding what type of bleeding this is. This was a type of menstrual bleeding, which was uh, constant. It couldn't be stopped. And again, as he had been bleeding for 12 years, this would have been understood in the system, the religious system at that time, that this woman would have been deemed unclean. This woman would have been unable to participate in the religious life of Israel. See, because she was ritually unclean and wouldn't be able to clean herself because she was constantly suffering from this, she would have been seen as a dreg, as an outcast on, this, on the fringes of society unable to be a functional part. And in typical Matthew fashion, um, again, if you read the Gospel of Matthew uh, enough times, you'll recognise that when he's giving the same account as what's in Luke or, uh, Luke or Mark, he often gives them, uh, probably the most briefest summary of these events. So in, in traditional fashion of Matthew, he only provides a summary of this encounter. But we read in Mark's account, Mark in Mark 5.26, that this woman had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything that she had, she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Humanity could not bring her the help or healing that she needed. Her dependence needed to be upon someone greater and, and she saw that, she recognised that in Christ. That just touching the fringe, just touching the end of Jesus' robe would be enough and that she would be made well. When you look at both of these accounts here, because obviously there's, there's an interweaving of two different accounts, two different narratives, one about Jairus and his daughter and the other one about this woman. You can see that both of them both Jairus and this woman, they saw the hopelessness in their situation. And they went to the only one who could bring them hope. The only person who could overcome the impossible. The impossible. For Jairus, what was that? It was to bring his daughter from the edge of death, from sickness and into life. For this woman, 
It was a whole 12 long years of suffering, on, of unhalting bleeding. And they went with their needs to Christ, believing and trusting that he would resolve their situations. And in these two interwoven stories this morning, we see two individuals who approach Jesus with faith. Because indeed, that is faith. They went to him knowing that he would be able to help, trusting that he would be able to help. One, Jairus, a leader in Judaism, would have been, being a leader of the synagogue, he would have been deemed a fairly important leader, religious leader at the time. So you have Jairus on one side, and then on the other, you have this woman who's an outcast of Judaism. And they both approach Jesus with their need. And he turns neither one of them away. Now we see that, of course, it is Jairus who approaches first. And when he sees Jesus, what does he do? He kneels down before pleading with him about his daughter. Again, being a leader of a synagogue in this time not only would have meant that he would have been a senior religious leader, but he would have been a senior religious leader during a time when most of the senior leadership or the Jewish religious leadership did not like Jesus. Unlike Nicodemus who came at night, this man came forward publicly. Such was his need, such was his desperation. Bowing down, he's likely he recognised that Jesus was indeed an exceptional emissary of God. Because look at what he requests. He requests, come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Again, if we take this into context, at this point in time, Jesus had not actually raised anyone from the, death, uh, from the dead yet. So this man didn't necessarily have the background that Jesus could raise people from death. But he still approached Jesus. Yes, there were two previous in, uh, accounts in the Old Testament who, where the dead had been raised, which it was by Elijah, as well as Elijah. But Jesus himself had not yet risen Lazarus at this point in time. And so by this leader, Jairus, coming to Jesus, bowing down and saying, please bring my daughter back to life. He was saying that not only do I see you as a man from God, I see you as an exceptional person sent by God. It's true, maybe he never, he, he, he unlikely had the full understanding of who Jesus was as we do, but he knew that Jesus was exceptional. And without any response, without any pushback, without any questions, what does Jesus do here? Jesus joins J Jairus. He joins him and, and along with his disciples, and they make their way to Jairus's daughters uh, in order to get. They make their way to Jairus's house in order to bring his daughter back to life. And it is in here, and it is at this point in time when we, where Jesus encounters the woman who touches the fringe of the robe. Like Jairus, this woman believes that Jesus, unlike all the human doctors that she went to, and again, she went through so many, that Jesus, unlike all these doctors, would make her well. I mean, look at the confidence in these verses. If I can just touch his robes. And so she stretches out and is instantly healed. Yet Jesus being so kind, so gracious, he, who always gives so much more grace than we think we need and beyond that of which we deserve. He says, and we see this in an, an account listed elsewhere in Luke and Mark, he says, who touched me? He's, who touched me? And by doing so, he allowed this woman to, to publicly uh, come forward and announce what had occurred. And what does Jesus, how does Jesus respond to her? He tenderly tells her, take courage or have courage, daughter. Take heart, be comforted. Be comforted. 
I, I love how Spurgeon records uh, this interaction between this woman and Jesus. He puts it that when she touched Jesus' robe, that along that line, along, as, as he stretched out and touched that woman's robe, along that line, faith sent its message and love returned the answer. Because, see, Jesus does not rebuke her for, her, for thinking that it would be by her, some quasi-magical touch that she would be healed. But rather, he gently corrects her. Your faith has saved you. Indeed, Jesus' compassion is such that he helps those who may not be the most doctrinally astute. She had came in faith to Jesus, even if her faith was imperfect. And he did not turn her away. Her away. John Calvin, when remarking on Jesus' tenderness, states that yet, yet Christ bestows high commendation on her faith. This disagrees with what I have lately noticed, that God deals kindly and gently with his people, accepts their faith through and perfect and weak, and does not lay to their charge the faults and imperfections with which it is connected. This woman reached out in through again. She did not know the full-blown understanding of how Jesus would help her, but she still reached out, knowing Jesus would help her. And she would not be turned away. Her faith had brought salvation to her affliction. Now, Jesus' word here, save, is worth pointing and picking up. This word, soso in, the, uh, soso in the Greek, which can mean that this faith has made her well, can be used when it comes into reference of healing, but it's mostly used when it comes to saving someone. Soso means save in the Greek. And it could mean that something happened here which was just more than just a physical healing, as she encountered the incarnate Christ, as he tenderly turned to her and healed her of her afflictions, it is likely that she came to a much bigger understanding of who Jesus was. Now, I do want to just make a small caveat that we need to make careful that it's not faith itself that heals, but God. Let's make sure we recognize that. But the exercising of faith in these verses did more than simply bring healing for this woman. The exercising of faith does so much more. Because in, when we, what, we read that after this healing, and this is from Luke's account in Luke 8, Luke 8, 49, 50, that while he was still speaking, someone from the synagogue leader's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard this, he answered him, don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be saved. See, that's the tenderness of Jesus. Don't be afraid. And Jairus believed Jesus' words. And once then, we see, of course, that once Jairus continues with Jesus to his house, we see that the parent's faith is well-placed. As these verses in Matthew 9, 23 to 25 states, when Jesus came to the leader's house, he saw the flute players and, cloud, uh, and the crowd lamenting loudly, leave, he said, because the girl is not dead but asleep. And they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in, took her by the hand, and the girl got up. Note Jesus' language that when those who come to him in need and in faith, he not only never turns them away, but he comforts them in their need. Take courage. Take courage, daughter. Don't be afraid. Because see, Jesus is always the one who comes to our condition, 
and applies his healing balm to where we're at. And this all ought to always help us recognize that in the situations that we find ourselves in, and we will find ourselves in a lot of difficult situations, we live in a fallen world. That in all these situations where we may find ourselves, no matter the difficulty, no matter the adversity, no matter how hard it may seem, we need to remember that we have a great, a compassionate, and a sympathetic mediator. For those of us who believe, for those who have faith, that we have this mediator who is always willing to minister to us. If only we go to him. Hebrews 4 puts it in this way. It's a verse I know that is many of us are undoubtedly familiar with. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is what they were experiencing firsthand. The tenderness, mercy, and grace of our Lord and Saviour. Who was sympathetic, understood their concerns, understood where they were at, and comforted them. Them. And this is why it, there's hope not just for Jairus, not just for this woman, but there's a hope that, is bec- that beckons to all, for all who will come to Christ. But this is, of course, why we must ask, ask ourselves, do we run to him for salvation? Do we run to him for hope? Where do we run? for salvation, if not him? Where do we run for hope, if not him? In the darkest storms that we face, in the adversity that comes, where do we run? Who do we rely on? What we read here in these verses this morning was part of the confirmation of Jesus' earthly ministry. Again, which is why Jesus later later on in Matthew 11 tells the followers of John the Baptist that the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. Again, these healings, these miracles in, in these verses was to confirm who Jesus was and the ministry that he was having in inaugurating his kingdom. But now we live, of course, on this side of the cross where the kingdom of Christ has been inaugurated and ushered in. And it is a kingdom that all those who trust in Christ belong to. And whilst it may not be that a kingdom which, of course, whilst it may not be a kingdom which brings physical healing, it does deal with the most important and pressing issues that we need to face life and death. And this is why the question is, who do we depend on in all matters, life and death? Fallible man or an infallible God? Are we those people who recognize, just like these two individuals, our need our dependency, and run to the only name under heaven that can't save? Or are we instead more like, have more in common with the funeral party here? That when they hear about Jesus, scoff, mock, disbelieve, because the reality is if we're not running to Christ, if we're not depending upon Christ, then we are mocking him for our lack of faith. We are rejecting the one that God had sent for us. As we mentioned before, as from Paul, 
in Romans 6, the wage of sin is death, which is everlasting, of course, everlasting death to those who reject and depend on everything but their creator, who continue on in their rebellion. Yes, you may come to church on Sunday, but what does that mean? If it's not for the sake of being found in Christ and in running to Christ, then it's all for naught. But this is a wonderful hope that we have. Paul doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't just simply say the wages of sin are death. That's it. He goes, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is why we need to remember what the writer, of the, the writer to the Hebrews actually states. He states that the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. See, Jesus, as we can see here, Jesus will never reject anyone who comes to him in faith. He will never turn them away. And the way to receive something from Jesus is to come asking for his gracious help. And this is help that he gives to, to which you don't deserve, I don't deserve it, but he gives it willingly and he gives it graciously. Friends, the reality is that there is more to faith than just believing that. We have to trust him, not merely trust certain truths about him. Again, look at the woman. She didn't really understand what she was doing. She trusted in the power of Jesus. But we have to come to Jesus and apply to him for what we need, as a ruler did, to plead to him, as a woman did. The only question, and this is a question which we have to ask, will you come? Will you turn your back on the world, all your selfish desires, your pride? Are you willing to count them rubbish but for the sake of Christ? To come to the one, not, not to not to to satisfy your earthly, your, your physical desires, which this world is so caught up about. Again, we, we were walking just yesterday in, um, in the local area and there's all these flags fluttering around uh, 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 because it's Pride Month. And again, now that we're close on the, uh, on the um, southern suburbs, uh, we're not too far from the beach. And Lucy was saying, that, again, how people dress and all that we live in a very self desirous world where we just cater for ourselves and our own whims. But are we willing to recognize that all those desires that the world will say, if you do this and that will satisfy it, that ultimately none of those things will satisfy it. All of those things give lo a lot of promise with little results. Are we willing to come to the one who can truly satisfy our needs? Brothers and sisters, you may be here this morning and you may be those who go, yes, I profess Christ. I'm listening to you uh, saying this and yes, I appreciate, I love Christ. But can I ask you just to ponder whether you are truly or fully dependent upon him? Because that's the question. Because sometimes we think that the greatest gift that we've received does not always address the deepest need we have. And it does. It absolutely does. Christ satisfies. And the reality is, if you're here this morning, and if you're still dissatisfied with your life, if you say you love Christ, you're, you profess Christ, but you're in still general dissatisfaction, and I'm not saying that discontentment doesn't, that Christians don't struggle with discontentment. We do. We're wrestling with the old man. But if you were still truly dissatisfied, then perhaps you need to find out how Christ truly satisfies. J.C. Ryle, the 19th century Anglican bishop of Liverpool, put it this way. Our faith may be feeble. Our courage may be small. 
Our grasp of the gospel and its promises may be weak and trembling, but after all, the grand question is, do we really trust only in Christ? Do we look to Jesus and only to, uh, to Jesus for our pardon, for our peace? If this be so, it is well. If we may touch his garment, we can touch his heart. Such faith saves the soul. Weak faith is less comfortable than strong faith. Weak faith will carry us to heaven with far less joy than for assurance. But weak faith gives an interest in Christ as surely as strong faith. He that only touches the hem of Christ's garments will never perish. And how true that is. But the question is, of course, are we those who are willing to reach out to Christ, to run to him as to our need, to run to him in our full dependence, not run to something else, which is doomed to fail, but to Christ. We ourselves, who are the recipients of God's grace, are always in need of it. Let, let us never think that as we become a Christian from the onset, that's all the grace we need. We need to be in constant and continuous supply. And the only question is, do we rely on that? Do we go to that? And are we fully dependent on Christ for that supply? Because the worst thing we can think is that we run to Christ and then we run back to ourselves. That's not the Christian walk. We run to Christ and we continue in Christ. But the one thing I do hope that you take away this morning is this. Who are you dependent upon? Who are you dependent upon? Who do you think can bring you the greatest hope, the, the, the greatest help? Because mankind, we're, we're hopeless beings. We're helpless beings. I speak to myself and I know I am a very, very fallible person. But lest us not kid ourselves, we know that we are fragile beings. We know that we don't know it all. And that should point us to the fact that we do have someone who does know it all, who is all-powerful, whereas we are weak, who is strong through our weakness. My hope is that we all will run to Christ with our needs, knowing he turns no one away and is always tender to those who come to, to come to him with their needs. And we are such needful people. So brothers and sisters here today, let us recognize that we are needy. Let's pray. Blessed Father, we thank you for the fact that we can always depend upon you. That whilst in the storms of life, and Father, we know living this fallen world that there are times of calamity after times of calamity, that we can always run to a firm foundation. We can run to the, the, a great anchor which holds us amidst the storm. But Father, help us to be those who do so not simply apply or, or do lip service, but recognize that we are in continuous need of his grace. Father, help us always run with our needs. And again, we are so needy. We are needy all the time because we are so fickle. We are so weak. Help us to be those who run first to you. Recognizing indeed that you do bring hope that you are the sovereign God, that there is not one thing which passes by without your decree, without your recognition, without your sovereign will. So, Father, we just, we just pray that again, again we will be those who recognize our need and like Jairus, like this woman, go to Christ, recognizing that that's not something we just do at the start. It's something we do always. And Father, for those, any person here this morning who's not in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we pray that you will open their eyes, drag them through the ditches if need be, and help them understand the necessity of, of dependency upon Christ. Christ.
that everything in this world is doomed to, to fail. Nothing else in this world can satisfy, but he can. Life in Christ satisfies completely. And help us all, Father, to, to recognize that and be desirous of being conformed to Christ. In his son's most blessed name, amen.